Hey everybody, NFT fans, welcome back to the Envelope Podcast. I'm your host, Eugene, aka Crypto MC, and I'm here today with Mr. Charlie Hu. He has a big passion on the future of web free, decentralized technology platforms and applications. He currently pushing the ecosystem of Polygon and Web Free. He's the Polygon head of China and managing partner of Lucid Blue Ventures. So, Charlie, thanks for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. I always started with a personal story in crypto. May you explain us briefly how did you get into the blockchain space and why? What was your main incentives? Thank you very much. So I am always kind of a bit libertarian thinking. I like, you know, rock music. That's kind of my very big personal hobby. Uh, and also I'm a very big gamer. So I enjoy all these kind of the current metaverse field. So I got to know crypto, specific Bitcoin in 2013 when I was in Amsterdam. So it was a kind of funny, uh, you know, any, any, any event. Like I went over to welcome my friends who travel all the way from Beijing to Amsterdam. So we, we end up with like having some pretty chill drinking in a coffee shop, you know, Amsterdam coffee shop. So then some people, you know, who were organizing the Amsterdam Bitcoin meetup just showed up, bring the old kind of old school FPG Bitcoin miners. That kind of was very fascinating to me. And then I started all the research about Bitcoin, you know, cryptocurrency, everything. So afterwards, you know, I went over to Berlin in 2015 and met some of the early Ethereum developers, including the former city of Gavin Wu, um, you know, then he, he built Polkadot afterwards, right? And uh, yeah, and I think my crypto career started in 2017, you know, you know by investing the Polkadot in the first round and actually start to actually building the ecosystem Polkadot from 2017 till beginning of this year. And, uh, you know, all kinds of things happened in the last three years. We, we kind of go through multiple circles of the cryptocurrency. And, uh, you know, I see the blockchain is involving so much. And uh, I feel definitely grateful to have the opportunity to work with, uh, with Polygon, which is also very fast growing like, ecosystem. And uh, yeah, and also pushing you know, the ecosystem building in China, bringing the bridge between the Western community and the, the East. Great story, I love it. May you explain us what is Lucid Blue Ventures, what it does specifically in the industry? Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, Lucid Blue Venture trying to be a very hands-on investor and value adding partner for all kinds of uh, blockchain you know, projects. We currently also invest in NFTs, and uh, some of the very fast growing NFT protocols. I, I, we always try to be, you know, we try our best. So we try, always try to be two or three months ahead of the the industry curve to do a lot of the you know advanced thinking you know what's the next thing you know what, why what kind of a problem is which remains to be solved in the industry right so that's kind of what, what we try to be the value added investor and advisor and uh, we have so far invested uh, around 70 projects in the space um, half of them are DeFi or you know fintech rated projects and the other 30 percent are in the empty space recently we've been deep dive a lot uh, we have been a lot of diving into the gaming space. You know, we call this Web, Web3 Gaming or uh, GameFi. You know, because of my experience in previous involvement with gaming industry, and uh, you know, we, we have, we're talking to a lot of the gaming companies right now as well. Truly, I'm personally curious, uh, what are the main principles how investment funds choose Web3 projects for investment? And, and many people around me are interested to maybe explain us the basic core things. How do they do that? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. So essentially, Web3 is very broad, right? It has a lot of uh, elements. I would say Web3, if we talk about technical perspective, we have almost five steps, five layers of tech stack, right? So at this moment, the industry is moving from the infrastructure that all the public chain we see in previous years, like you know, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and then previously, previous years like EOS, right? And then we have some Cosmos, Polkadot, Recently, we also have like Polygon, many other infrastructure scaling solutions. Right? We move much to the upper layer, such as all the applications, like we have the defense, we have decentralized finance, we have all kinds of the new applications, NFT, privacy protection. In the future, we will see the decentralizing you know, IOTs and other spaces, right? So being an investor in the Web3 is certainly a bit different to the web, you know, the traditional, let's say, internet or technology world, which is uh, faster. The industry is evolving in a very fast space, uh, pace, right? And it's very global based. So we need to learn a lot of things from different sectors, from different uh, regions. So I think 
most of the successful Web3 clubs we invest in, they have a very global driven vision. So they have to be global from day one. So they, there's no such a thing, I, in my opinion, there's like a regional, you know, limited Web3 projects which can be successful. So we're always looking at that. And uh, to be a very good Web3 investor, you act, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, you always look at the founders. So in, in this field, it's very, how to say, human talent driven and intense. The great founders can achieve a lot of things. So I think that the ratio of excellent founder compared to not so good founder, it could be sometimes one to one thousand type of ratio compared to let's say in some industry, let's say a taxi driver, it could be maybe just one to three. Yeah, yeah and I understand more. It's like you're on your Facebook, uh, the world is consists of not from objects, but from people. So every perspective startup is, is, is people. Uh, why have you chosen right. Polygon? Is, is it hard to be the head of Polygon in China? It is certainly very challenging. It's a lot of work. There's this, you know, ecosystem growing in a very phenomenal pace, right? Um, it's more like mutual selection, right? So I was kind of diversifying my research and kind of portfolio because uh, I saw some challenge in the Polkadot from last year. They had a multiple delay due to many, some reasons. And uh, I started to do some research and actually invest in other fields such as the gaming side, and the NFT side, right? You know, different ecosystems, like Petco, BSC, even Tezos and other things. And uh, I, I know, you know, previously Polygon was called Matic. Right? It's a very strong engineering team from India. Uh, Sandeep, as the one of the co-founder, he had uh, AMA in China community. I was, uh, I assisted them. So I know Sandeep and the co-founder since last year, right? And uh, I saw they have a very successful integration with Aave, one of the leading DeFi protocols on Ethereum. So be a full stack scaling solution for Ethereum projects, Polygon, that have multiple auditors of, you know, transaction fee and safe. That's really interesting. So Polygon changed, Matic changed the name to Polygon this year. And I see they're doing bigger scope with a higher ambition. So that's why I view it's pretty fascinating. And uh, it's a very, very nice coincidence. The CMO, Ming Kim, she, she we, we have been friends for years. She reached out to me and, uh, you know, and uh, we had a nice conversation. That's why, like, I read, after several meetings, I'm like, okay, I'm very, very motivated to join. And, uh, and since April, there we go. And so far, a lot of things happened after. Well, let's jump into our core topic conversation, the realm of NFTs. How did you get your first exposure to the world of NFTs? And how do you explain, especially for non-crypto people, what the hell is NFT? Thanks for the question. So I think uh, my first impression of NFT, now found the token as this technical technology was all the way from 2018. I met uh, Benny, one of the co-founders of Crypto Kids, right? They, he came over to Shanghai. We had a pretty nice time together. You know, I, I was showing him around, have helped him interpret, interpret most of the meetups. Uh, in, in the China joint events, right? There. At that time, we had the first wave of, I would say, the decentralized applications, right? And uh, CryptoKitties as one of the first Ethereum was quite successful. And a lot of people thinking about besides ICO, besides token sale, right? What are those, what are the use cases blockchain can do, right? At that, at that time, we don't really have all these, you know, past Ethereum type of, you know, copy chains, which is kind of pretty good for the field, right? And I think, the whole critical mass achieved since last year, you know, especially you know, all the collectibles, including Topshop, all that right, become very trendy. And then we see a lot of the new kind of, uh, quite, a lot of the new type of assets kind of merging into the sphere, right? We have music NFT, movie NFT. We also have kind of financial NFT coming up. So to, to explain NFT, a very layman, simple term, NFT, each of the NFT everybody holds is unique by itself, right? It has its own time lock, its own time rate, right? And has its own attributes, which is unique from each other. So compared to NFT, we have to, to, to talk about the FT, which is fungible token. Fungible token means it's like Bitcoin. It's like the you know digital currency or whatever. Every single one Bitcoin you own is essentially the same as the one the other one. The other people own. So if you own one Bitcoin, the other person own a one Bitcoin, that Bitcoin itself in that network is essentially the same. It's identical, right? It has a 
same value at the same time, right? And it's transactable, right? For NFT, it's different because uh, the NFT itself represents certain property. It could be a JPG image, which is pretty fun and pretty hype right now with all the crypto pumps, all the, you know, all the, all the apes right now. But every single N NFT that represents a very specific property it could be an image, could be a video, could be a test, it could be a financial tickets, it could be many, many things. But it has to be, it is unique. That's your own asset, right? So that represents a certain interesting attributes that can represent like a culture, something like that. So I think NFT is now getting to a very emotional field. Like a lot of artists are entering the space, a lot of musicians are entering the space, right? Which is more than just, uh, let's say, a currency, right? So I think that that opens up a lot of the, the horizon for a lot of people who talk about blockchain right now because a lot of different fields with a lot of different content, a lot of different materials are using NFT for different types of purpose. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. Uh, how, I'm wondering, how do you explain why did we face NFT hype in 2020, 2021, especially in digital art space? And was it similar or maybe differ comparing to the famous ICO hype in 2017? That's a good question. I think this question, uh, we can we can talk about this in multiple angles, right? So on a technical angle, I see after 2017, 18, right, um, uh, on the Ethereum ICO bubble, and then you know the, the market had a correction, right? Um, after that bubble, we had three years of pretty solid engineering work, right? With all kinds of public chain and new ones, which is higher performance, lower transaction fee, including you know Polygon that actually has been deployed and fully built and launched the mainnet, right? So we, people actually can use that, deploy their smart contracts on this kind of platform. So the transaction fee, the transaction fee become much cheaper. I'm talking about hundreds of times cheaper, right? So in Matic, we use $10 worth of Matic token for, for your transaction fee. Transaction fee, you can use more than 10,000 transactions. So every transaction, you, you spend 0 0.00004 dollars that kind of you know even sometimes even less than that so you don't feel a very big friction to trade to mint to trade you don't have to do all the other stuff in ethereum the gas fee is too high sometimes when the, that when we're entering a gas pool you literally need to spend hundreds of dollars i'm talking about two hundred dollars for a one smart company if your nft asset itself is less than two hundred dollars value it doesn't make sense to create that, right? That's not stop. So that's basically stopped a lot of people to use NFT for all kinds of reasons, right? So I'm seeing that happening in gaming. In game, you're gonna do a lot of transaction spending and so on, right? And it's gonna be high frequency. But if you're gonna spend a lot of transactions every single transaction, it's not gonna be very user friendly, right? I, 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 it's probably gonna stop you from playing the scene at all, right? So I think this is a very important reason on technical perspective. Why NFT created and become a hype, or let's say a lot of people kind of entering the space because the technology is relatively much more mature compared to three years ago. Then the other reason is on the culture side. In the last couple of years, crypto become much bigger scale in terms of more people, more money entering the space, right? We have a much higher TBL token lock value in the DeFi side. NFT becomes something we are exploring to expand not just finance, right? So we have people who have artist background, we have people who have music, all the other backgrounds, who wants to create new things, right? You know, which has interesting content and interesting uh, follower base, right? So we see a lot of NFT, which is, is very strong focus on fan tokens, right? That kind of stuff. So these people who are not familiar with NFT, uh, blockchain in general, they enter the space since last year, right? Because of the culture and all that. So it's, I think that's pretty interesting to see new people entering the, the, the industry. But that's on the culture side. Yeah, I think the last point, that's part, last part, if I may, to talk about on this is the finance side. Because DeFi has been so mature, I, I wouldn't say mature to the like institutions, but it is relatively mature and battle tested in the, within the crypto native community. Right? A lot of NFTs can use DeFi protocols to create new liquidity. You know, the, the, you know, it becomes more and more smooth to use, to trade in, right? We see that happening in OpenSea, which is a very strong NFT partner built on Polygon, right? We see that kind of platform become mature, usable. We see real liquidity going down. 
And that's basically the reason NFT becomes something you don't hold that and lose your money. It's actually a possible liquid assets. You know, people can actually hold and actually, you know, resell to others as needed. Well, how would you describe the main problems, pains, challenges, or even diseases of uh, relatively young NFT markets and its participants? Uh, I think that if we talk about some of the, the, the pitfall, or let's say the bottleneck, right, on NFT, or I, or I would call that bottleneck, but maybe that's the kind of word I would use, right? Um, we don't really have really good content still. A lot of NFTs have pretty much very low value of content, which is not resonating to the users. And I, I, to be honest, some of the NFT um, assets is, is, is not really that meaningful. You know, you, you don't really, you, you can't really use that for real use cases. You can hold it, but uh, it's really subjective choice, right? Why people hold this collective, right? I think that the higher level of content needs to be entering the space, you know, to maintain your kind of NFT assets. That's the important part on, on, on the bottom left side. The other side is, I would say, have all kinds of composability or financial uh, new protocols to use NFT as, as, as a new layer of assets for different kind of, uh, you know, uh, ways, right? So we can use that for lending. We can use that for collateral assets, like synthetic assets. We can use that for other kind of financial insurance and so on. So I think the integration between DeFi and NFT is not mature, uh, has some, quite some ways to go. And the, the, the scope of NFT right now, I would say, to be honest, is still a bit narrow mind. So a lot of people talk about NFTs, only I talk about art. For sure, art is a very important part right now for the NFT world. But it's not it's much more than that. The, the scope of NFT can certainly go to different dimensions, so entering the, you know, the movie industry, entering the finance industry, entering the IoT, and entering many, many ways. But we just don't see that kind of application being built yet, right? So that, that's why when I feel we still have a lot of things can be done in the NFT space. That's also, I feel, bullish for the future of NFT you know, has a lot of potential still unlocked, still remains to be unlocked. Great, talking about the future, you've mentioned use cases. How do you see the potential use cases of NFT as a tool beyond the digital art? What purposes they will likely be used for in the nearest, let's say, 10 years? Yeah, so, you know, Polygon has a lot of, uh, I would say, you know, within Polygon system, we have more than 50% of DeFi profits. They are using NFT as kind of a module or like a protocol to create some type of financial tickets as an NFT. I think that's a very interesting um, uh, use case to expand from digital art to some specific field, right? So for example, in Uniswap V3, every single position you create for the trading, that's essentially an NFT. Every single person creates a unique trading position at, at a specific different time, right? That's unique. So we, we see that happening in QuickSwap, in, in SushiSwap, some other polygon native uh, decentralized exchanges happen, right? We also see some kind of multi-chain NFT happen. Some kind of protocol trying to create multi-chain NFT as a mint protocol protocol, you know, that actually have pretty interesting some, uh, solution with insurance. So if you have certain ways to use the NFT that has some kind of risk involved, you can use that insurance protocol to hedge your risk, that kind of stuff. So I, I think, so I see like NFT is not just collectible. I mean, it could expand to much, if much, man, like many more different dimensions, right? So you can use that for many different reasons. One, another thing I would say is very interesting and exciting for me to talk about, and, you know, to brainstorm with other developers is on the game itself. Every single unique game items you create in the games, it's essentially a good NFT. And we can see some of the NFT is able to be involved. Right now, most of the NFT is static. You buy an uh, NFT in art, it, it, it holds in your wallet, that's it. It's it's static, you know, it doesn't change. It's always going to be the same as it is. For gaming assets, a lot of NFTs is dynamic. Because you play, you achieve certain credits or something, that NFT can evolve, can appreciate, you know, you know with some kind of attributes, and with some kind of color, or some other functionality on lock. So we see dynamic NFT coming up soon in gaming or many other different use cases.
uh, that's going to be very interesting. Great, I love it. I am personally satisfied with the technical infrastructure for NFTs right now. I mean, different blockchains, wallets, marketplaces, and so on. So for or is that in the baby stage, and it will be highly developed in future. Yeah, um, I think I think we, we, we really need to have more developers to kind of uh, work to work towards it. Right? So right now, um, Polygon is organizing our two months global hackathon. Right, I think majority of the developers at this our hackathon is trying to solve certain problems in the NFT space, which is needed, which is of course needed, and also a lot of demand. And I, 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 I really think with more talents build different solutions. We, we can we can work on this together. So yeah, we, we give a lot of interesting developer grants to develop a team, including you know uh, some NFT team like uh, Nifty's and some others. They are they received our Polygon grants, and uh, with our EVM compatible chain next step, a lot of the Ethereum projects can pretty much easily to deploy on Polygon and to, to kind of try our cheaper get production. I want to ask you about the legal issues, so the NFT development of NFT markets. Uh, I've said the majority, the great range of legal issues. And how do you see, will governments be tending to maybe to create a specific legal frameworks for NFTs beyond other fungible digital virtual assets like they do? It's a good question. So I'm not a lawyer, right? I can't really comment from a very professional legal perspective. But what I've, what I've been seeing and talking with some of the people from Singapore and some other countries, I see specific, you know, how uh, to say, uh, legal, you know, you know, experts and trying to write down some kind of a legal framework to frame NFT as an interesting assets, right? So essentially, NFT should not be treated as a security token, I say. At, right, at this moment, it has most of NFT aiming to serve specific adoption or use cases, right? So we would, we, would, we couldn't, but because it's it's the non fungible side, right? It's not really fungible. It doesn't really, doesn't really equal to like a currency per se either, right? So it's not really a traditional fungible token, utility token, and definitely not a security token. So which category is this kind of asset belongs to? I would say it's kind of, kind of like a digital property. Property could be digital land, digital real estate, digital art assets, or many other things. What I just mentioned about game assets as well, right? Each asset is different, is unique, and put into NFT. So it's just kind of like buying a, a, a property, let's say, Buy, buying or uh, a, a, a commodity product, right? So most of the NFT marketplaces kind of serve a similar functionality as an e-commerce platform, right? You have a lot of different, you know, products you're selling and buying, right? That, that's kind of what I see, like OpenSea, Terra Virtua, all the other, you know, platforms that do. Talking about legal issues, regulation, governments, virtual assets, and taking into account that you are in China right now, I'm recording this podcast, I have to ask you about the China. China is one of the biggest in the most bigger newsmaker in the crypto industry, everybody knows that, especially in uh, regular items of banned crypto industry. Uh, we know to want the truth. We're, we are not in China. We want to know the truth. What is the real China's approach? I mean, China's people and China's authorities to the crypto industry. May you explain us to divide the truth from, from the hype in the hype? Okay. Thank you for the question. So I think Chinese government is very looking forward to the blockchain technology itself, right? We have national level policy trying to encourage you know, blockchain technology to really go to the next level, right? We are building our own DCP, you know, blockchain service network, BSM, and so on. To be honest, actually, Polygon is working closely with BSM, uh, BSM, a BSM team to get integrated on, on, into their intrapreneur network platform. But uh, in, the, in the regulatory side, yeah, China is getting uh, stricter on certain non, uh, how to say, uh, a bit more ethical actions, such as, you know, wash trading, some of the non-regulated exchanges, right, so on and so forth. So I think in terms of technology, China is really encouraging that. In terms of the, the asset trading, China has certain regulation and censorship, for sure. And uh, on, uh, in terms of, how to say, the 
the, 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 the whole policy side. It's kind of an interesting um, uh, double edged thing, right? We can't comment that oh, China is banning everything. We are banning the mining, which are actually very cost consuming crops. We're not banning IDC you know, service. We're not buying proof of stake sticker validate. You know, that's the clear cut difference. We are not banning the technology. We're actually massively using this technology. We're providing training for developers, for university students to learn what is blockchain, to use blockchain to do certain things. What we are banning is non ethical trading, which is kind of, you know, you know kind of non transparent and actually, you know, get a lot of people's, uh, you know, especially the, the retail investors, people's mindset rapidly works in other ways, right? So just saying trying to ban anything is not true. Just saying China is freeing everything, which is not also not true, right? We have our way to kind of protect the investors and also trying to make the industry not too irrational. Well, thank you for that answer. Now I understand more from the real person in China. Finally, Charlie, what is the best way to follow you on the internet if you let people follow you on the internet? And we ask for those who want to meet you for a business proposal, what is the best way to meet you around the world on, on events or, or <laughs> some of the private situation where? Yeah, due to the COVID, right, we can't really travel. I wish I can travel to many cities. I, I need to go to, I really want to go to some other, uh, some other cities. Like this year, we have a lot of events going to Miami, Dubai, right? So I'm, I'm kind of stuck in China, right, for the time being. Um, so I made, I'm mostly based in Shanghai. Uh, the best way to connect me is online is on LinkedIn. You can search me with Charlie Yue Chuan Fu. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious to find me with my profile out of China on, on Polygon, on you know, Blue, and uh, many other experiences in crypto. And, uh, you know, I, I think I, I do have my Twitter, but I don't use it very often. I, I, I think the best way to connect me is just, yeah, search me on the LinkedIn. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We, we're talking with Charlie Hu, the passionate man from China in web free decentralized technology platforms, the Polygon head of China and managing partner of Lucid Blue Ventures. She came to Shanghai and I met him personally. He is there. Please like, share, comment, subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell button. We're trying to publish daily in English and Russian. Charlie Hu and Eugene Crypto MC, where with you, we're watching the Envelope podcast. It is supported by the Envelope DAO and the Nitsi Protocol. And see you in the next episodes. Bye-bye. Rich, bye-bye.